We now begin chapter 18. In this chapter, you will learn some of the characteristics of macroscopic systems. <clears throat> Our modern understanding of matter is that macroscopic properties, such as pressure and temperature, have their basis in the microscopic motions of atoms and molecules, and we'll spend some time exploring this micro-macro connection. As you know, each of the elements in most compounds can exist as solids, liquids, or gas, the three most common phases of matter. The change between liquid and solid, freezing or melting, or between liquid and gas, boiling or condensing, is called a phase change. Water is the only substance for which all three phases, ice, liquid, and steam, are everyday occurrences. Four states of matter are observable in everyday life, solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. Many other states are known to exist only in extreme situations, such as Bose-Einstein condensates, neutron degenerate matter, and quark-gluon plasma. We will not explore these other uh, states of matter. A solid is a rigid macroscopic system consisting of particle-like atoms connected by spring-like molecular bonds. Solids are nearly incompressible, which tells us that the atoms in a solid are just about as close together as they can get. The solid shown here is a crystal, meaning the atoms are arranged in a periodic array. Elements and many compounds have a crystal structure in their solid phase. A liquid is a system in which the molecules are loosely held together by weak molecular bonds. The bonds are strong enough that the molecules never get far apart, but not strong enough to prevent the molecules from sliding around each other. A liquid is more complicated than either a solid or a gas. Like a solid, a liquid is nearly incompressible. Like a gas, a liquid flows and deforms to fit the shape of its container. A gas is a system in which each molecule moves through space as a free, non-interacting particle until, on occasion, it collides with another molecule or with the wall of the container. A gas is a fluid. A gas is also highly compressible, which tells us there is lots of space between the molecules. Gases are fairly simple macroscopic systems, hence many of our examples in Part 5 will be based on gases. In thermodynamics, we define the state of a substance in terms of the various properties we can attribute to it. Temperature, pressure, volume, entropy, enthalpy, internal energy, mass, and density. A state variable is one of the set of variables that are used to describe the mathematical state of a dynamical system. Intuitively, the state of a system describes enough about the system to determine its future behavior in the absence of any external forces affecting the system. The ratio of an object or material's mass to its volume is called the mass density, or sometimes simply the density. As a note on convention, in this chapter, we will use an uppercase m for the system mass and a lowercase m for the mass of an atom or molecule. Table 18.1 lists the density of various materials in the SI units of kilograms per cubic meter. Other units of densities may be familiar, such as grams per cubic centimeter. In this problem, we wish to find the mass of a lead pipe given its dimensions. From Table 18.1, lead has a density of 11,300 kilograms per cubic meter. Since the shape is given as a cylinder, you will need the volume of a cylinder, pi r squared times the length of the cylinder. You also need to realize that it is a hollow cylinder, not a solid cylinder. You should pause the video to work on the problem. Since the density is mass divided by volume, we rearrange for mass. The density is known, so we just need the volume of the lead cylinder which is the difference of the inner and the outer cylinders. The outer and inner radii are known, as well as the length, so the volume can be calculated, given a mass of 1.7 kilograms to two significant figures. Remember, when doing intermediate calculations, it is advisable to keep additional digits and do the rounding on the final answer. 
The number density is the number of atoms in a solid divided by its volume, which is around 10 to the 29 per cubic centimeter. The number density of a gas depends on the pressure, but is usually less than 10 to the 27 per cubic centimeter. What is the volume of the cube? The answer is E. Remember, one meter is 100 centimeters. One way to specify the amount of substance in a macroscopic system is to give its mass. Another is to give the measure of the amount of substance in moles. By definition, one mole of matter, be it solid, liquid, or gas, is the amount of substance containing Avogadro's number of particles. To three significant figures, Avogadro's number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 basic particles per mole. The number of moles is the number of particles divided by Avogadro's number. The atomic mass number is by definition an integer. It is written as a leading superscript on the atomic symbol. It is the sum of the number of protons and neutrons in an atom. For example, the common isotope of hydrogen with one proton and no neutrons is 1H. The heavy hydrogen isotope called deuterium, which includes one neutron, is 2H. The primary isotope of carbon with six protons making it carbon, and six neutrons is 12C. The radioactive isotope 14C, used for carbon dating of archaeological finds, contains six protons and eight neutrons. The atomic mass scale is established by definition the mass of carbon-12 to be exactly 12U, where U is the symbol for the atomic mass unit. One mole of carbon-12 has a mass of 0 0.012 kilograms, which gives one atomic mass unit as 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. The basic particle depends upon the substance. Helium is a monatomic gas, meaning that the basic particle is the helium atom. Thus, 6.02 times 10 to the 23 helium atoms are one mole of helium. But oxygen gas is a diatomic gas because the basic particle is the two-atom diatomic molecule O2. One mole of oxygen gas contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules of O2, and thus 2 times 6.02 times 10 to the 3 oxygen atoms. The atomic mass of any other atom is a mass relative to carbon-12. For example, Careful experiments with hydrogen find the mass ratio as 1.0078 divided by 12. Therefore, the atomic mass of hydrogen is 1.0078 U. The atomic mass in U is close, but not exactly equal to the atomic mass number. If the atomic mass m is specified in kilograms, the number of atoms in a system of mass m can be found from the mass of the substance divided by the mass of an atom. The molar mass of a substance is the mass of one mole of a substance. The molar mass, which will designate m mole, has units kilograms per mole. The number of moles in a system of mass m consisting of atoms or molecules with molar mass m mole is the mass divided by the molar mass. Which contains more molecules, a mole of hydrogen gas, H2, or a mole of oxygen gas, O2? They each contain the same number of molecules. Mole is a count of the number of basic particles. It does not distinguish between different basic particles. A hundred grams of oxygen is how many moles of oxygen?
The first method is to determine the number of molecules in 100 grams of oxygen. The oxygen atom, O16, has an atomic mass number of 16. Oxygen gas is a molecule containing two O16 atoms and must have an atomic mass of m equal 32u. The mass of one molecule of O2 is 5.31 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. The number of molecules is the total mass divided by the mass of one molecule or 1.88 times 10 to the 24 molecules. The number of moles is the number of molecules divided by Avogadro's number, which gives 3.13 moles. The second method is to determine the molar mass of oxygen gas. The oxygen atom, O16, has an atomic mass number of 16. Oxygen gas is a molecule containing two O16 atoms and must have an atomic mass of 32 U. The molar mass of one molecule of O2 is 0 0.032 kilograms per mole. The number of moles is the total mass divided by the molar mass, or 3.13 moles. What is temperature? Temperatures are related to how much thermal energy is in a system. More on this in chapter 20. For now, in a very practical sense, temperature is what we measure with a thermometer. In a glass tube thermometer, such as the one shown, a small volume of liquid expands or contracts when placed in contact with a hot or cold object. The object's temperature is determined by the length of the column of liquid. The Celsius temperature scale is defined by setting zero degrees Celsius for the freezing point of pure water and 100 degrees Celsius for the boiling point. The Kelvin temperature scale has the same unit size as Celsius with the zero point at absolute zero. The conversion from Celsius scale to the Kelvin scale is to add 273 to the temperatures in degrees Celsius. Do not use the degree symbol with Kelvin. The conversion from Celsius to Fahrenheit is to multiply the Celsius reading by 9 fifths and add 32 degrees. The scales show the three most commonly used temperature scales. The Fahrenheit scale is used in the United States. Celsius is used in the rest of the world. The Kelvin scale is used in science. Which has the largest increase of temperature? A change of one degree Celsius is the same as one Kelvin. A change of one degree Fahrenheit is nine fifths or 1.8 times as large as one degree change in Celsius. Therefore, the right answer is D. Any physical property that changes with temperature can be used as a thermometer. In practice, the most useful thermometers have a physical property that changes linearly with temperature. One of the most important scientific thermometers is the constant volume gas thermometer. This thermometer depends on the fact that the absolute pressure, not the gauge pressure, of a gas in a sealed container increases linearly as the temperature increases. A gas thermometer is first calibrated by recording the pressure at two reference temperatures, such as the boiling and freezing point of water. These two points are plotted on a pressure versus temperature graph, and a straight line is drawn through them. The gas bulb is then brought into contact with the system whose temperature is to be measured. The pressure is measured, then the corresponding temperature is read off the graph. Figure A shows a constant volume gas thermometer. Figure B shows the pressure-temperature relationship for three different gases. Notice two important things about the graph. There is a linear relationship between temperature and pressure. All gases extrapolate to zero pressure at the same temperature, 
T is minus 273 degrees Celsius. No gas actually gets that cold without condensing, although helium comes very close. But it is surprising that you can get the same zero pressure temperature for any gas and any starting pressure. This temperature is called absolute zero and forms the basis for the absolute temperature scale, Kelvin. As temperature of a gas changes, volume of a gas changes. At zero degrees Celsius, with pressure constant, volume changes by 1 over 273 for each degree Celsius. The support force is from the collisions of atoms with the container wall and subsequent momentum transfer. Without the collisions, there is no momentum transfer and hence no support force. At absolute zero, the volume of a gas is zero. Objects expand when heated. This thermal expansion is why the liquid rises in a thermometer and why pipes, highways, and bridges have expansion joints. The figure shows an object of length L that changes by length delta L when the temperature is changed from T to T plus delta T. For most solids, delta L over L is proportional to delta T with a proportionality coefficient alpha called the material's coefficient of linear expansion. The extreme heat of a summer day causes the buckling of these railroad tracks. The gap in the roadway of a bridge is called an expansion joint. It allows the bridge to expand and contract. If an object's volume changes by delta V during a temperature change, delta T, the fractional change in volume is the coefficient of volume expansion times the change in temperature. Solids expand linearly in all three directions, and in the process, a solid changes its volume. The fractional change in volume is three times the fractional change in length of the sides. For solids, the coefficient of volume expansion is three times the coefficient of linear expansion. The table shows expansion coefficients for various materials. For gases and liquids, there is no coefficient of linear expansion. A 55 meter long steel pipe runs from one side of a refinery to the other. By how much does the pipe expand on a 5 degree Celsius winter day when 155 degree Celsius oil is pumped through it? We just need the coefficient of linear expansion for steel from table 18.4. The pipe will expand by 9.1 centimeters. A steel plate has a 2 centimeter diameter hole through it. If the plate is heated, what happens to the diameter of the hole? The inner part of the steel pipe has a circumference of 12.6 centimeters. As the pipe is heated, the circumference linearly expands, meaning the diameter of the pipe must increase. Suppose you were to remove an ice cube from the freezer, initially at minus 20 degrees Celsius, and then warm it by transferring heat at a constant rate. As you heat the solid, the thermal energy gets so large, the molecular bonds begin to break, allowing the atoms to move around. The solid begins to melt. The temperature does not rise until all of the bonds are broken. The figure shows the temperature as a function of time. The process is repeated as the liquid warms and evaporates into steam. During the process, the ice and then the water undergo a phase change.
phase change is characterized by a change in thermal energy without a change in temperature. The amount of heat energy that causes one kilogram of a substance to undergo a phase change is called the heat of transformation and given the symbol L. The heat of fusion, L sub F, is the heat of transformation between a solid and a liquid. The heat of vaporization, L sub V, is the heat of transformation between a liquid and a gas. You must explicitly include the minus sign when it is needed. A phase diagram is used to show how the phases and phase changes of a substance vary with both temperature and pressure. At the normal one atmosphere of pressure, water crosses the solid liquid boundary at zero degrees Celsius and the liquid gas boundary at 100 degrees Celsius. At high altitudes, where pressure is less than one atmosphere, water freezes at slightly above zero degrees Celsius and boils at a temperature below 100 degrees Celsius. In a pressure cooker, P is greater than one atmosphere and the temperature of boiling water is higher, allowing the food to cook faster. Notice on the water phase diagram that the dashed line at P equal one atmosphere crosses the solid liquid boundary at zero degrees Celsius and the liquid gas boundary at 100 degrees Celsius. These well-known melting and boiling point temperatures of water apply only at standard atmospheric pressure. You can see that in the Denver, where P atmosphere is less than one atmosphere, water melts at slightly above zero degrees Celsius and boils at a temperature below 100 degrees Celsius. A pressure cooker works by allowing the pressure inside to exceed one atmosphere. This raises the boiling point. So foods that are in boiling water are at a temperature above 100 degrees Celsius and cook faster. Crossing the solid liquid boundary corresponds to melting or freezing, while crossing the liquid gas boundary corresponds to boiling or condensing. But there's another possibility. Crossing the solid gas boundary. The phase change in which a solid becomes a gas is called sublimation. It's not an everyday experience with water, but you probably are familiar with sublimation of dry ice. Dry ice is solid carbon dioxide. You can see on the carbon dioxide phase diagram that the dashed line at P equal one atmosphere crosses the solid gas boundary rather than the solid liquid boundary at T equal minus 78 degrees Celsius. This is the sublimation temperature of dry ice. Liquid carbon dioxide does not exist, only at, but at pressures greater than five atmosphere and temperatures greater than minus 56 degrees Celsius. A CO2 fire extinguisher contains liquid carbon dioxide under high pressure. You can hear the liquid slosh if you shake a CO2 fire extinguisher. Food takes longer to cook at high altitudes because the boiling point of water is less than 100 degrees Celsius. One important difference between the water and carbon dioxide phase diagrams is the slope of the solid liquid boundary. For most substances, the solid phase is denser than the liquid phase and the liquid is denser than the gas. Pressurizing the substance compresses it and increases the density. If you start compressing CO2 gas at room temperature, thus moving upward through the phase diagram along a vertical line, you'll first condense it to a liquid and eventually, if you keep compressing, change it to a solid. Water is a very unusual substance in that the density of ice is less than the density of liquid water. This is why ice floats. If you compress ice, making it denser, you eventually cause a phase transition in which the ider turns to liquid water. Consequently, the solid liquid boundary of water slopes to the left. The liquid gas boundary ends at a point called the critical point. Below the critical point, liquid and gas are clearly distinct and there is a phase change if you go from one to the other. But there is no clear distinction between liquid and gas at pressures or temperatures above the critical point. The system is a fluid, but it can be varied continuously between high density and low density without a phase change. The final point of interest on the phase diagram is the triple point where the phase boundaries meet. Two phases are in phase equilibrium along the boundaries. 
The triple point is the one value of a temperature and pressure for which all three phases can coexist in phase equilibrium. This is an, that is, any amounts of solid, liquid, and gas can happily coexist at the triple point. For water, the triple point occurs at 0 0.01 degrees Celsius and an atmosphere of 0 0.006 atmospheres. The significance of the triple point of water is its connection to the Kelvin temperature scale. The Celsius scale required two reference points, the boiling and melting points of water. We can now see that these are not very satisfactory reference points because their values vary as the pressure changes. In contrast, there's only one temperature at which ice, liquid, water, and water vapor will coexist in equilibrium. If you produce this equilibrium in the laboratory, then you know the system is at the triple point temperature. The triple point temperature of water is an ideal reference point. Hence, the Kelvin temperature scale is defined to be the linear temperature scale starting at zero Kelvin at absolute zero and passing through 273.16 Kelvin at the triple point of water. Because T sub three is 0 0.01 degrees Celsius, absolute zero on the Celsius scale is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. If the pressure of liquid water is suddenly decreased, it is possible that the water will The pressure drop can cause a liquid to solid phase change or a liquid to gas phase change. The ideal gas model is one in which we model atoms in a gas as being hard spheres. Each hard sphere fly through space and occasionally interact by bouncing off each other in perfectly elastic collisions. Experiments show that the ideal gas model is quite good for gases if two conditions are met. The density is low, the atoms occupy volume much smaller than that of the container, and two, the temperature is well above the concentration point. We've been using the term atoms, but many gases, as you know, consist of molecules rather than atoms. Only helium, neon, argon, and the other inert elements in the far right column of the periodic table of the elements form monatomic gases. Hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen are all diatomic gases. As far as the translational motion is concerned, the ideal gas model does not distinguish between a monatomic gas and a diatomic gas. Both are considered as simply small, hard spheres. Hence, the terms atoms and molecules can be used interchangeably to mean the basic constituents of the gas. The state variables for an ideal gas are the volume, V, of its container, the number of molecules, N, of the gas present in the container, the temperature T of the gas and its container, and the pressure P that the gas exerts on the walls of the container. These four state parameters are not independent of each other. If you change the value of one by, say, raising the temperature, then one or more of the others will change as well. Each change of the parameters is a change of state of the system. Experiments during the 17th and 18th centuries found a very specific relationship between the four state variables. Suppose you change the state of a gas by heating it or compressing it or doing something else to it and measuring P, V, N, and T. Repeat this many times, changing the state of the gas each time until you have a large table of P, V, N, and T values. Then make a graph on which you plot P, V, the product of the pressure and volume, on the vertical axis, and NT, the product of the number of moles and temperature in Kelvin, on the horizontal axis. The very surprising result is that for any gas, whether it is hydrogen or helium or oxygen or methane, you get exactly the same graph. In other words, nothing about the graph indicates what gas was used because all the gas give the same results. No real gas could extend to N times T equals zero, because it would condense, but an ideal gas never condenses because the only interactions among molecules are hard sphere collisions.
If the volume of a sealed container of gas is decreased, the gas temperature Temperature depends on volume and pressure. Without any information about the pressure, it is not possible to tell. Two identical cylinders, A and B, contain the same type of gas at the same pressure. Cylinder A has twice as much gas as cylinder B, which is true. The amount of gas is characterized by the number of moles of the gas. The volume of the two cylinders must be the same, and we are told the pressure is the same. To maintain a constant value, if the number of moles of the gas decreases, the temperature must increase. The original temperature must be lower than the new temperature. Two cylinders, A and B, contain the same type of gas at the same temperature. Cylinder A has twice the volume of cylinder B and contains half as many molecules as cylinder B, which is true. Using the ideal gas law, the new pressure is found by proportional reasoning. The number of molecules is decreased by a factor of two, and the volume doubles, meaning the new pressure is four times the original pressure. One hundred grams of oxygen gas is distilled into an evacuated 600 cubic centimeter container. What is the gas pressure at a temperature of 150 degrees Celsius? <laughs> Treating the gas as an ideal gas, we can use the ideal gas law. The volume has to be in cubic meters and temperature must be in Kelvin. We cannot use degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit when using the ideal gas law. All ideal gas problems involve a gas in a sealed container. The number of moles and the number of molecules will not change during the problem. If the gas is initially in state I, characterized by the state variables P sub I, V sub I, and T sub I, at some later time it is in a final state F. The state variables are characterized by P sub F, V sub F, and T sub F. These sets of state variables have the ideal gas relationship for a sealed container. The temperature of a rigid, constant volume, steel container of gas increases from 100 degrees Celsius to 200 degrees Celsius. The gas pressure increases by a factor of Since the volume is constant, the only variation is in the temperature. 
When using the ideal gas law, temperature must be in Kelvin. A cylinder of gas is at zero degrees Celsius. A piston compresses the gas to half its original volume and three times its original pressure. What is the final gas temperature? If you need more time, pause the video. Use the ideal gas law for a sealed container and solve for the final temperature. An ideal gas process is the means by which the gas changes from one state to another. Even in a sealed container, the ideal gas law is a relationship among three variables. In general, all three change during an ideal gas process. As a result, thinking about cause and effect can be rather tricky. Don't make the mistake of thinking that one variable is constant unless you're sure, beyond a doubt, that it is. An ideal gas process can be represented on a graph of pressure versus volume called a PV diagram. Knowing P and V and assuming that N is known for a sealed container, we can find the temperature T by using the ideal gas law. Here is a PV diagram for three states of a system consisting of one mole of gas. There are infinitely many ways to change the gas from state one to change three. Here are two different trajectories on the PV diagram showing how the gas might be changed from state one to state three. If you slowly pull a piston out, you can reverse the process by slowly pushing the piston in. This is called a quasi-static process. We assume that the process occurs so slowly that the system is never far from equilibrium. In other words, the values of P, V, and T at any point in the process are essentially the same as the equilibrium values they would assume if we stopped the process at that point. It is an idealization, like a frictionless surface, but one that is very good approximation in many real situations. An important characteristic of a quasi-static process is that the trajectory through the PV diagram can be reversed. If you quasi-statically expand a gas by slowly pulling a piston out, you can reverse the process by slowly pushing the piston in. The gas retraces its PV trajectory until it is returned to its initial state. A sudden process cannot be represented on a PV diagram. The expanding gas is not in thermal equilibrium until some time later when it has completely filled the large container. We cannot retrace the steps to return the process to its initial state, so it is an irreversible process that cannot be represented on a PV diagram. This textbook will always assume that processes are quasi-static. An isochoric process is one for which V final equals V initial. Iso is a prefix meaning constant or equal, while choric is from the Greek root meaning volume. Warming the gas with a Bunsen burner will raise the pressure without changing its volume. This process is shown as the vertical line one to two on a PV diagram. A constant volume cooling by placing the container on a block of ice would lower the pressure and be represented by a vertical line from two to one. Any isochoric process appears on a PV diagram as a vertical line. A constant volume gas thermometer is placed in contact with the reference cell containing the water at the triple point. After reaching equilibrium, the gas pressure is recorded as 55.78 kilopascals. The thermometer is then placed in contact with the sample of the unknown temperature. After the thermometer reaches a new equilibrium, the gas pressure is 65.12 kilopascals. What is the temperature of this sample?
If you need more time, pause the video. The thermometer's volume doesn't change, so it's an isochoric process. Use the ideal gas law for a sealed container and solve for the final temperature. Keep in mind the temperature must be in Kelvin to get the correct answer. A constant pressure process is called an isobaric process, where baric is from the same root as barometer and means pressure. An isobaric process is one for which P final equals P initial. The gas pressure is determined by the requirement that the gas must support both the mass of the piston and the air pressure pushing inwards. The pressure is independent of the temperature of the gas or the height of the piston, so it stays constant as long as M is unchanged. If the cylinder is warm, the gas will expand and push the piston up, but the pressure determined by the mass M will not change. This process is shown on the PV diagram as the horizontal line 1 to 2. We call this an isobaric expansion. An isobaric compression occurs if the gas is cooled, lowering the piston. Any isobaric process appears on a PV diagram as a horizontal line. A cylinder of gas has a frictionless but tightly sealed piston of mass M. A small flame heats the cylinder, causing the piston to slowly move upward. For the gas inside the cylinder, what kind of process is this? This is an isobaric process. The pressure is exerted from the outside. The piston stops moving when the inside pressure matches the outside pressure. A cylinder of gas has a frictionless but tightly steel piston of mass M. The gas temperature is increased from an initial 27 degrees Celsius to a final 127 degrees Celsius. What is the final to initial volume ratio? Since this is an isobaric process, using the ideal gas law for a sealed container simplifies to the ratio of the temperatures. The initial and final pressures must be the same. Using Kelvin as a temperature scale gives a ratio of volumes of 1.33. The two cylinders on the figure contain ideal gases at 20 degrees Celsius. Each cylinder is sealed by a frictionless piston of mass M. How does the pressure of gas 2 compare to that of gas 1? Is it larger, smaller, or the same? Suppose that gas 2 is warmed to 80 degrees Celsius. Describe what happens to the pressure and volume. Treat these gases as ideal gases. If you need more time, pause the video. In part A, the pressure in the gas is determined by the requirement that the piston be in mechanical equilibrium. The pressure of the gas inside pushes up on the piston. The air pressure and weight of the piston presses down. The gas pressure, P, is the atmospheric pressure plus the weight divided by the area. Depends on the mass of the piston but not at all on how high the piston is or what type of gas is in the cylinder. Thus, both pressures are the same. Neither does the pressure depend on temperature. Warming the gas increases the temperature, but the pressure determined by the mass and area of the piston is unchanged. Because PV over T is a constant and P is a constant, it must be true that V over T is a constant. 
As T increases, the volume V must also increase to keep V over T unchanged. In other words, increasing the gas temperature causes the volume to expand. The piston goes up, but with no change in pressure, this is an isobaric process. An isothermal process is one for which T final is equal to T initial. Because PV equals NRT, a constant temperature process is a in a closed system, constant N, is one for which the product PV doesn't change. So P final times V final is P initial times V initial. The location of the hyperbola depends upon the value of T. A lower temperature process is represented by her hyperbola closer to the origin than a higher temperature process. This figure shows four hyperbolas representing the temperature T1 to T4, where T4 is greater than T3, is greater than T2, is greater than T1. These are called isotherms. A gas undergoing an isothermal process moves along the isotherm of the appropriate temperature. A cylinder of gas floats in a large tank of water. It has a frictionless but tightly sealed piston of mass M. Small masses are slowly placed onto the top of the piston, causing it to slowly move downward. For the gas inside the cylinder, what kind of process is this? By adding weights to the top, the external pressure changes, so it is not constant pressure. Since the volume is changing, it is not isochoric. The tank of water allows heat to flow out of the cylinder and maintain the same temperature throughout the process, so this is an isothermal process. What type of gas process is this? This is none of the processes we know. The volume and pressure change, so it's not isochoric or isobaric. The curve is not a hyperbola, so it is not isothermal. A gas follows the process shown. What is the final to initial temperature ratio T sub F to T sub I? Even though this is not isobaric, isothermal, or isochoric, it is a process that can be represented on the PV diagram and must be reversible. A reversible process can be described by the ideal gas law for a sealed container. Since we have the initial and final pressure and volume, the ratio of the temperatures can be found. A gas of two atmosphere pressure and a temperature of 200 degrees Celsius is first expanded isothermally until its volume has doubled. It then undergoes an isobaric compression until it returns to its original volume. First show this process on a PV diagram, then find the final temperature in degrees Celsius and pressure.
If you need more time, pause the video. The path on the PV diagram is shown in the figure. From 1 to 2, the process is isothermal. From 2 to 3, the process is isobaric. Using the ideal gas law allows the pressure at 2 to be found. Using the ideal gas law again allows the final temperature to be calculated. Look at problem 18.47, and we will work the solution next class. Look at problem 18.62 and we will work the solution next class. Look at problem 18.64 and we will work the solution next class.